Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Words on Whiskey, brought to you by Irish Whiskey Magazine. So we're up to episode nine already, so time is flying by. Uh, hope you've had a great week. Uh, enjoyed last week's show, and uh, we have a very exciting guest with us this week. But just before we kick off, uh, take you up to date with what's happened over the, the last week. So I suppose the big news is... Uh, We've now hit more distilleries than we have counties uh, with the addition of uh, a number of new distilleries, including Black's and the latest one, Sleeve League Distillery. And uh, you can see here a, a lovely architect's preview of what the distillery will look like up in Ardara, up in County Donegal. And uh, delighted for James and Moira, who have really struggled hard to get to where they are now and have finally got the plans underway and will start construction in September. They are working from a, a makeshift uh, distillery in Carrick at the moment, and they have laid down their first whiskey, which is a double distilled peated whiskey. And they plan to do triple distillations. They've ordered three, four size stills, and they will be producing only peated whiskey and there are some very interesting facts about their distillation and uh, more of that to come in the future so we wish them the very best to look i know they fought very hard um obviously at the moment they're producing or they're they're selling the silky and the darky whiskies and uh, a, a gin also and uh, their new distillation promises to be something that is very interesting. It'll be a pot still and will contain 20% oats. So they plan to start production next spring and we'll be really looking forward to see what they're going to do. It'll be a non-GI compliant uh, pot still, but uh, a more traditional style that would have been considered pot still not so long ago. Uh, we've a couple of new releases as well this week. So we've got the Proclamation which is from the same crowd behind uh, the uh, whiskey produced uh, by the crowd that are working uh, of Mayo. And this whiskey is a 40% or 40.7% ABV blend with a slight cherry finish and it retailing at 34 euro. So it's great value and it's, it's a lovely package uh, an honor and a tribute to those in the proclamation of 1916. So the, the people behind this are the, the same people that are behind the Grace O'Malley series of whiskies. And also up north, there's two releases from the guys that are actually involved with Cologne Distillery as well. They've produced uh, two releases, two stacks, uh, and it's the, the first cut and the blender's cut, and they are available online at Irish Malls, a uh, number of other uh, retailers, including Celtic Whiskey Shop. And the pricing for these is $49.95 and $99.95. And the blender's cut is actually 61.3% uh, ABBV. So it's a fair whack at that. So, um, and I think there's only 222 bottles that are available. So that's what we have in terms of new releases. In terms of other activity happening during the week, Belfast Whiskey Week is in mid-flow, and it's been a huge success so far. We've attended a couple of the events, and they finish up on Sunday, I believe it is, in which the two stacks will be officially released. Other news is um, a call between distillers groups in the US, UK, and Ireland looking for tariff reductions due to the difficulties with COVID. So something there to help save jobs. As always, our, our show is available as podcast for download uh, from your favorite podcast player. Just search Words on Whiskey. And you can catch us on YouTube as well at our channel. And I'll just put the, the link online there. If you wish to subscribe, uh, please, please do so. Uh, so that's shared with you there now. And, uh, okay, well, look, we're delighted to have our upcoming guests here. It's our first independent bottler, and um, Sabine Sheen 
is the general brand manager and global brand ambassador for Lamb Bay Whiskey Company. So I'll just bring her in here. Sabine, good evening. Hi, how are you? Lovely, you can hear lovely me great to join us. I hear you very well, and I'm very jealous of the backdrop you have there. Yeah. I wish I was actually by the sea, but I'm in my living room. <laughs> you're in your living room. Well, look, thank you very much for joining us. It's great to have you here. And like I say, you're our first independent bottler. Um, for those that don't know you, Sabine, you, your current role is general brand manager and global brand ambassador and everything else for Lambay Whiskey Company. So just yeah. tell us what you do. Yeah. Yeah, so I um, I started uh, when we built the company in uh, 2017, and I'm based here in Dublin. And yeah, so my role is was really to kind of help set up the company in Ireland and uh, start the the whole brand uh, building exercise on on a new product and a new company. And um, it's it's taken me far and wide. So as a startup company, yeah, I'm wearing many hats, but it's a great learning process as well. Yeah. But I mean, you have an awful lot of experience. Do you want to, I suppose, take us back to where you're from and, and, and how you ended up in the kind of roles you are and your involvement with other whiskies? Okay. Um, all right. So I, I guess I've always kind of been around whiskey. It's been a passion of mine from a very young age. Um, so I always kind of worked in hospitality um, and kind of in a sales and marketing role. But uh, I started actually my career more intensely with whiskey when I worked with Irish Distillers. Um, so I worked with them for nine years as the sales and marketing uh, manager for their brand homes, uh, Middleton and the Jameson Distillery Bow Street in Dublin. So that took me across a very diverse range of the whiskey business, understanding of course the production processes, um, at the same time being an ambassador uh, for tourism. Uh, and of course then uh, striving to, to make sure that the the brands underneath that portfolio were, were getting the, the attention they needed um, in terms of anything to do with Ireland and and tourism and whiskey. So that was um, a great learning because, as you know, Middleton is the custodians of Irish whiskey, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, have the expertise and knowledge of which um, I was very fortunate to have uh, absorbed like a sponge um, when I got the, the chance to, to spend time with masters even in Barry Crockett era. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I've never looked back from that experience and learning that I got through through those people. It's just been fantastic. Um, and then in 2017, I was offered an opportunity to start something new, a little bit of a new adventure. Um, and at the time, I was looking for something a bit different. Um, so to get a chance after so many years working with a, a multinational and, and a number one brand, um, I wanted to have the chance to build something up from, from the ground up, start uh, a whole new story uh, and hopefully a legacy that, that will continue for generations to come. Um, when I'm old and grey, it'd be nice to know if Lambe is still on the shelf. Well, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. But, I mean, was it a difficult decision to make, to make, uh, to jump from a highly successful company to a startup? Um, the decision, I think, was based on my personal preference at the time. I wanted to move into something with a little bit more autonomy, um, where I could really see the, the fruits of my labour kind of come to, to life. Um, and at the same time, it was scary leaving all the securities that come with working with a multinational, without doubt. Um, and, and, you know, the dependency of, of so many departments and people and teams going into a situation then when you are in a solitary role um, and then working literally across the water with the colleagues in France. So yeah, at the start it was a little bit daunting. I, I can't deny it, but um, I haven't looked back since and, and I just love what, what I've been doing since, you know? So um, yeah, it has its challenges without a doubt. You don't have the liberty of IT departments and PR people and lots yeah. of people to help you. But um, yeah, so, you know, at the end of the day, um, it, it's all part of life experience. Yeah. So you're very much uh, running the show, essentially, from Dublin anyway. Um, oh, well. You're coordinating, you know, I... <laughs> coordinating, obviously, with with uh, people in yeah. Camus. So, I mean, yeah. this product, obviously, so Lam Lambe set it up in 2017, was it, initially? Mm -hmm. yeah. What yeah. did they come to you with? What was the proposition in terms of 
Was there a brand? Was there any talk of a partnership with Camus at the time? Or No, it was, it was quite secretive at the start, of course. Um, I, I think uh, my, my priority was understanding the liquid and yeah. um, I needed to know what the product was and, and what was its, its profile, what was its construct um, before I could really jump ship. And um, I did play a little bit of hardball to understand uh, exactly what the taste profiles were first. Um, because I couldn't stand behind anything or build something from scratch unless I actually truly believed in the liquid. Um, and, and I'm glad to say I, I did. And then it transpired that, you know, this was a partnership with, with an independent cognac house, um, one of the last family owned cognac houses in the world, and they date back to 1863. So there was this, you know, there was this legacy there already um, in terms of, of the story. It wasn't something that was just created out of blue. And so therefore, um, the, the whole blending and finishing side of the proposal was immediately intriguing because one, I didn't know anything about cognac, um, but two, I did have a passion for wood and finishing and anything to do with barrel aging. So when that did uh, transpire, I, I was immediately hooked on, on the um, innovation of what these guys were trying to do. Uh, so, was yeah, it bearings? Was it the Bearings family that approached you to, had they something in mind when they started or was it a blank think, sheet of paper? Well, I think essentially it was Camus. We were one of the brands under the Camus Le Grand Marc, which is, you know, the, the, the mothership company that gives us, I suppose, the, the, the distribution uh, globally. But at the same time, we're independent, if you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they had already established uh, the plans and the idea and framework with the Bearings five years previous, um, yeah. it, it was something that they had been discussing for quite some time. Um, and uh, the, the bearings who, who live on the island naturally were looking towards uh, sustainability, sustainability for the future and what can they do to ensure that the, the island lives on and, you know, and that it has a future. So I think they, they, they both came to a kind of a, you know, united decision based on their similar uh, ideals of entrepreneurship, uh, they both uh, were friends. They had a they're bonded by a, both the love of nature and and their family heritage is kind of linked them in terms of everything they do is about you know quality, rarity, refinement, um, and it just seemed like a kind of a, a natural symbiosis between the the two families. So yeah, yeah, it was it was led primarily by Camus, without a doubt. Yeah, for those not familiar with Lambay Island, do you want to perhaps tell them a little bit about it? I'll, I'll show some. Uh, some pictures okay. of Lambay Island now. So that's, yes, uh, that's, that's, that's the that's island. They're leaving the island. So um, yeah. Lambay is, is kind of um, one of these uh, islands hidden in plain sight. It's off the coast of Skerries in North County Dublin. It's around five kilometres um, uh, away from the city. And it's basically a, an island that is kind of shrouded in, in mystery and, and, uh, and nature and, uh, and history. It dates back to the eighth century when the Danes first landed there and, and has been in occupation by families and, and uh, lineages uh, all throughout time. Um, ultimately, where our story kicks off is that it was purchased in 1904 by a man called Cecil Baring, hence bringing in the Baring story. Right. And, and basically, he, he moved onto this island when it was literally in ruins. It was, uh, there was an old 15th century fort there that he uh, spent um, his time renovating. Um, and himself and, and Maud, uh, a couple, you know, left New York City at that time, moved to this island uh, that they purchased and just decided to live a, a very private life in, in very different conditions to what we have now. When you consider it must have been quite a, a world away from, from the, the, the comforts of New York City in, in the 18th century. But sure. um, what we have now today is, is an extraordinary architectural um, construct where... The, the, the castle has been built into um, uh, kind of domestic buildings as well as a renovated area as kind of set within a stone circle amidst kind of sycamore trees. Um, and they, in, in, they hired a, a famous architect of the time called Edwin Lutyens, who was quite, you know, well renowned for the, his authentic arts and crafts style. Um, and, and he spent 24 years um, establishing all of the buildings that are on Lambay today. So what we're looking at here in this picture is actually the, the family castle and, and the old uh, original stone fort, which was a, built as a fortress, obviously, to, to protect uh, uh, the island. 
Um, and within that then is, is a little farm buildings, uh, gardens and uh, a rose garden, as well as the family mausoleum. Um, on the outside of that circular structure is then down by the coastline on the western shore, are domestic buildings called the White House, uh, the Coast Yard Cottages that you can just see there in that picture. And those Coast Yard Cottages are now after being um, transformed into what are now our bonded warehouse space for our casks. Um, so it has a hospitality space on the island. There's 10 private rooms with kitchen facilities. Um, the island is used a lot for, you know, uh, retreats. The family use it privately as well for, you know, um, particular VIP experiences, etc. So we we tend to use it. That is a picture of our very, um, uh, you know, I suppose, delicate uh, tasting room because we don't have a visitor centre. So we're literally utilising the family's home, uh, their private rooms, um, and, and it, it kind of dispels this certain kind of feeling of, of being brought into the inner circle when you visit. Um, so we, we offer private bespoke tastings in the White House as part of our, our visitor experience when people visit. And, um, and the history of the island is kind of a combination of, believe it or not, tennis, because it has an, an open air tennis court on it, um, one yeah. of the last remaining in Ireland. And, and uh, at the same time, you know, it has a, a boathouse and it has uh, beautiful garden spaces, um, as well as being a nature reserve. So while there's only six human beings living on the island uh, at any given time, um, the island is is completely overwrought. It's a, it's a natural um, wildlife sanctuary and bird sanctuary. Uh, so it has a very delicate ecosystem um, of which we're very aware of. So yeah, yeah tell us a little bit about that uh, ecosystem because you've got some very interesting wildlife on there, including some puffins and uh, wallabies. And <laughs> obviously, the puffin yeah. is your 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 logo essentially, or your yeah, mascot. The, the puffin is our mascot, and you know I I do he's popping up everywhere, but I do kind of carry him with me. So. Oh, um, right. This, this was not a puffin that was harmed in the process of this program. Let's just. Oh, good. Glad to hear that. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, the, the island is um, full of wildlife. As I said, it has fallow deer, Atlantic grey seals, um, oaks, which are our, our puffins, um, over 120 species of bird, um, anything from Manx shearwaters to kittiwakes, guillemots, uh, grey gulls, etc. And uh, the wallabies were a, a, a recent introduction, when I say recent, back in the, in the 50s when yeah. they were donated by Dublin Zoo due to overcrowding in the zoo at the time. Um, and the bearings held on to two and uh, they've been living in, in bliss since. So there's actually a herd of over 250 redneck wallabies living um, on so the So they've island. enjoyed themselves. They're just having a ball, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a hard um, life. So, you know, it, it's a harsh environment actually, you know, the yeah. island at times it's exposed and um, it has all of the the, the, the winds and, and the rain that we get on the mainland, but it does remain a one or two degrees warmer um, than the mainland, believe it or not. Yeah. And the wallabies uh, just seem to be very comfortable there. Um, there's plenty for them to eat, and uh, and they and they they they're free basically. They're not farmed or anything like that. Yeah, they came from the zoo originally, did they? Yeah, that's right, Dublin Zoo. Right. Um, so. Uh, yeah, it's it's often a, a kind of a, a weird uh, revelation when you're walking up the hills and you see a little wallaby hopping around. And, and even to this day, people don't know or believe that they're there. But I know the locals in North County Dublin can see them sometimes when the tide is out and they can see them hopping on the horizon. So, yeah, they're, they're a quirky little species. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a lovely island. It's a lovely sight. And I've had the pleasure of being there twice now. And the weather was just glorious. Uh, I'm sure on a winter's day, a typical day. Oh it yeah, yeah, uh, quite intimidating. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's, yeah, but you know what? I I kind of I love that. I mean, you did experience it when it was almost like a kind of a subtropical type of environment. It was really hot, and the grass was scorched yellow. It looked like you know a scene out of Africa at, at one stage two years ago when we had a hot summer. Uh, this year, there's just been plenty of rain, so it's it's rich. Uh, the soil is rich. It's green. There's an abundance of, of fauna and flora on there. And I think that really is this kind of recycling of nature that takes place, you know, over the years yeah. and everything just blossoms and blooms. There's a very unique um, rock on the island called porphyry, um, which is a type of green color. Um, and, and all of the minerals that come up from the water, which is on the, the Trinity well uh, on the island, is 
is actually coming from an original volcanic spring. So there's quite a lot of, of, of good botanicals as well as pure water there. So it's it's naturally going to be um, a place of, of intense beauty when it's when it's saturated. And, and that water is used from the well. That's used to cut the whiskey as well, is it? Yeah, so we, we don't distill on the islands. So we're not using water in the distillation process in our distillery that we use. Um, but we do take the water from the island and use it then at the final stage of bottling just to bring down the ABV uh, to whatever percentage we need. And it also connects a little bit more of the island to, to our production process as well. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously at the moment you're you're sourcing your whiskey. Um, what are the challenges of actually... One, sourcing whiskey as an independent bottler. And secondly, we see that you have a maturation room there on the island. Just getting the logistics of getting the whiskey out onto the island must be horrendous. Yeah, um, I'll take the first part of your question is, is yeah, I mean, as you just said in your news there, now well, we have 33 distilleries in Ireland. Um, and when I started in the business, there was, I think, four. Um, yeah. So we're seeing that uh, there's a lot more distilleries producing liquid um, and have been doing so for quite some time in the last uh, 10 years. Um, and, the, you know, I suppose in a way, are they all going to be having their own separate brands and, and global distribution? One doesn't know, but it's certainly become a bit of a shopper's market for, for our concept when we look at um, purchasing really good quality distillates from these distilleries. Um, and then we take over the art of, of maturation, blending and finishing. Um, while at the same time we have a challenge because we're an independent bottler, we can never truly predetermine the volumes that we may need. So we're kind of working on projections and and then if we, we suddenly get a, a huge surge in a particular market, we really have to scale uh, our, our, our processes and understand how do we, we enable uh, the distribution to, to be you know, maintained. Um, while at the same time then uh, purchasing liquid for the future, uh, yeah. of where we want to be in the next 10, 20 years, 30 years. So the liquid that we want for the next bottlings coming down the line in the next five years have been purchased already and and going through their maturation processes. So we're, 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 we're constantly in this kind of ebb and flow stage as an independent bottler. It would yeah. be beautiful to have uh, full control of our production process. I know our master blender and production manager would, would love nothing more mm -hmm. and hopefully that day will come. But uh, right now, we're, 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 our focus uh, as, as a brand is, is to build a brand in, in, com in countries first, establish yeah. a product and distribution channel, and then slowly we can start to, to up our, our production processes and volume to match our market placements. That's kind of the idea. Yeah. Then on the other side, um, we do have plans for the future. A micro distillery, we've planning permission uh, in place for that on Lambe. And you're right, Sergius. I mean, logistically, anything on an island is is going to incur a lot of uh, cost and stress. <laughs> and yeah, and imagine. a variable that you can never depend on is uh, Mother Nature. Um, mm. So we might... I don't have... know, being, being locked on an island with due to bad weather in a distillery for uh, six months doesn't sound the yeah. worst thing in the world. You know? Yeah, uh, it might not be a bad thing, but... Um, when you have barrels that have been shipped from France and they're standing on the, the yeah. shore in Dublin waiting to get over and, and you know, all, everything costs money at the end of the day. So this isn't something that, that comes cheaply. It, it's, it's with big investment um, yeah. and even taking water off the island, everything has to work on a schedule. So we, we, have, we have multiple, you know, distribution areas or, 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 or production areas on the mainland um, and they all need to be synchronized to our, yeah. our particular logistics. So, yeah, it's, it can be challenging, but at the same time, um, it's, it's also part of our crafted approach. We, we're small batch. We have, to, we have to really try and talk and, and, and understand our ways of working. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some days I can bask on over and not a ripple in the water. And other days it's a white knuckle ride all the way while the casts are shaking on the boat. So, yeah, yeah it's all part of the excitement. Yeah. But I mean, you, you took independent distilling or independent yeah. bottling and, and made it a little bit even more difficult than it would have been by placing mm -hmm. it on an island. Uh, we just got nice comments there but from JP Brown uh, commenting on your whiskey being great value and great tasting whiskey. I mean, in a very short period of time, actually, you have made significant inroads. Uh, what are your primary markets? 
Um, I guess uh, we obviously, I mean, we, we prioritize the USA um, and pre-COVID uh, was slightly different um, sure. mapping where, we, you know, number one was USA. And, and then, of course, putting a lot of emphasis in, in Europe, UK, France, Germany uh, um, and Ireland, of course. Now, um, we understand Ireland is hugely competitive. Um, and we wouldn't have uh, as much of the volume expectation in, in this environment. But where I've been pleasantly surprised is the immense growth in Russia, um, yeah. both in Moscow and in St. Petersburg are just, they're just selling like hotcakes at the moment. They really like their, their Irish whiskey over there. And yeah. then um, we've really made inroads with Asia um, that I'm very thankful for. We launched only in China two weeks ago, uh, okay. very small, but yet significant. Um, uh, we've we've had uh, good duty free reach in global travel hubs around the world, and that was also in Bangkok, Hong Kong, uh, Dubai, um, and we're also uh, got a, some nice distribution and single cast strength, which was just launched in Japan. So both Tokyo and Osaka are reacting quite well as well. So Korea has been becoming um, ever a growing market, however small. Um, but uh, France and Germany have become uh, really strong as well. We're seeing a uh, an invigoration of interest in France, particularly for Irish whiskey, which is great, because right. I know it's struggled for quite some time. Um, and the UK, of course, uh, is 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 growing as well. So now I would say post COVID, while the USA is still important to us, I think we're really putting a lot of our our, our focus and determination towards the likes of Russia, Eastern Europe, um, Poland, Germany, France, uh, and maintaining our position, however small it is, in in our Asian markets. Yeah, but uh, as an independent bottler and having the support of, of Camus behind you, obviously they've they're very well established in Asia and Russia, I'd imagine, and in the in the luxury markets. Is is Lambe looking at those luxury markets, or because Lambe uh, as a as a brand, it is luxury, but it's also playful. You know, the it's not a serious serious. I mean, there is a touch of cheekiness to the brand as well yeah yeah you're right it's um it's i suppose it's a unique positioning because um as i said again we are a startup company so naturally and i suppose you know intelligently you place yourself where your distribution or your mothership can put you you know at the yeah. start so while camus is is luxury um their cognacs are luxury um they have, I suppose, our, our biggest um, win was their legacy and history with uh, global travel retail. Yes, so they yeah. could um, open doors for us that we probably would never have had or it would take us a much longer time um, in, in global hubs that uh, do see little Irish whiskey in terms of, of, of choice. You have your top four that you would expect to see. Um, mm -hmm. But now it, it's great when you, you pass through and then you see a bottle of Lambay you know, whether it's yeah. in Auckland or it's in Hong Kong or, you know, um, uh, and uh, in Dubai is is a mark of the success that Camus has, I think, in terms of their history, their good yeah. relationships and their recognition of quality. And yes, I mean, we, we share a stand sometimes on the same shop floor. And while one st side of the stand is, is super sleek and luxurious uh, representing Camus, uh, mm -hmm. Lambay has a, a very quirky, as you said, kind of a crafted approach, yet yeah. premium and super premium. So we, we do we do that in a very subtle way, um, maintaining our tone of voice as being, you know, not too serious, non-gender. We, we're not one of those kind of stuffy brands uh, that 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 give you an ethos or, or a way to drink it. We really like people to see us as being playful, a little bit different um, yeah. and reflecting, I suppose, the quirkiness of everything that Lambay Island is. Um, so when you see these two positioned on a shop floor, it, it is a unique uh, a marriage of concepts from a branding perspective. But the customer seems to like it. Yeah. Oh, we've seen a lot of experimentation with different cask finishes. Lambe from day one has all been about the cognac. Uh, and of course, having a family run business and, a, and a, a strong brand behind it must really help open doors, especially to those markets that you talked about. But uh, but even their experience in terms of production of cognac, uh, we were out in cognac earlier in the year, and you know the similarities between whiskey production and cognac production, although although there are differences, of course, you know 
the the attention to detail and the care in which they take to actually produce spirit is, oh. is incredible. You know, it's, uh, just going to show a few pictures here, Sabine, of um, the island. So here you see Cyril Camus on the left, uh, Alexandra and Patrick Leger, who was yeah. the blender for uh, Lambay Irish whiskey. Um, and that's on the land, I think that's two years ago, is it? That was actually our launch in um, a pre-launch we did in 2017. Oh, um, and it went public in 2018. Um, so yeah, that that's Cyril on the left and Alex in the middle and the right. Um, Cyril comes from this um, long legacy, five generations of cognac producers. This is a picture of Chateau Plessis um, set on 280 uh, hectares in the Borderies crew uh, region of cognac. It's in the heart of the cognac appellation. Um, and, and Borderies is one of the smallest um, and rarest crew uh, uh, areas representing less than 5% of the cognac AOC. So yeah. the Camus, uh, their, their, their home, I suppose, their, their residency is, is set on this area and surrounded by 188 hectares of kind of cultivated grapes, um, yeah. five variants of grapes um, that surround this particular area and it's all naturally preserved. Um, so everything about what they've done and the reason why they're still independent since, since 1863 in this era of multinationals is, and it's a family run business, is, is because of their approach to rarity, refinement. Um, yeah. their, their particular distillation processes are really incredible. Um, and, and what they place a lot of value on is uh, the intensity and aroma of their casks um, coming from these very rich areas um, and grape areas in France. Uh, their eau de vie is one of the finest in the world. And it's something that really blew me away when I did uh, go through the whole learning process with um, uh, their masters in Lanarol in, in, in France, um, yeah. is, is that they, as the French are, they just bring this beautiful tradition along in a very elegant way. And you can see by some of the pictures there, their visitor center is, is, is very um, personalized. It's very small in terms of, you know, it's, it's an intense experience. Um, and the, the aroma and intensity of the casks that they use using, of course, French oak um, it are just deliver profound, uh, rich flavors, um, which makes it immediately uh, appealing then when we consider how we finish our whiskey. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a perfect complement to the whiskey that you're producing. Uh, it brings a, a sweetness and a richness and a fruitiness that's really incredible. Right. But it, it's... You know, it's heartwarming to see the passion that goes into their production of, of, of the cognac. And I think that must be transferred to your, your whiskey production, I, I presume. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our, our production um, manager is now, and, and, and master blender is Yonel Bernard. Yeah. <clears throat> and even came from a long lineage of, of uh, cognac uh, producers in France. So, you know, everything comes with a, a certain amount of legacy and experience, I suppose. Um, and, and 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 a driving passion for what we do, um, yeah. and and so too uh, by by our finish, a lot of people may just think that we're we're buying in bulk and putting it in 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 cognac casks, but we, we really do have the luxury of having those casks in Camus personally selected for us, um, where we we go through this testing and trial and understanding the intensity of the flavors in the wood. And then match that to the distillates that we're placing into those casks. It's a truly enlightening experience because we control the whole process from sure. the cask yeah. selected right towards, you know, uh, maturation and product uh, and bottling. Um, so, you know, our casks arrive a little bit wet, not too dry. They're not necessarily yeah. always the oldest casks. That's not always the formula of, of, of success. But it's really about the richness and intensity of flavors that the eau de vie has imparted into the wood. Um, and I'm, I'm never I'm never bored by that. Uh, every time no. a cask arrives, I pop open the bung and, and take a good long inhalation and it, it always intrigues me about these aromas. But I mean, that cognac is specially selected to be compatible, if you like, with the whiskey that you're using. It, it's not their standard Camus cognac. No. You know, it, it's, it's cognac that is selected to match. Yeah. It is, and, and, and just to explain that a little bit further, it's um, the reason why, I mean, you just wouldn't be able to take, you know, a, a 20, 30 year old uh, cognac cask and just think you can 
place it into a, a very young spirit, which our, our whiskey is maybe four or five years old between the blend yeah. and the single malt. So, you know, it, it, it would almost break your heart. Any master blender would, would agree with me, I'm sure. So the, the cognac casks that we have um, sent over to us are pre-prepared. They are, they has, there is an eau de vie concentration in them that has been yeah. specifically distilled to suit the new distilled spirit in, of whiskey that we're putting into them. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, you're right. There, there's a there's a pre pre preparation long before we get to uh, bring them to Ireland. Yeah. How long do they spend in the cask? So presumably you, you have whiskey that has spent time in, I presume, bourbon casks, and then goes yeah. into yeah. the cognac cask. Yeah, exactly. So all of our our current range is bourbon cask finished um, yeah. or matured, I should say. Sorry, and uh, and then we we take over that that final process. So um, it depends on conditions. So naturally we have a, a, a bulk, our bulk storage is on the mainland in Ireland, um, down near West Cork. Yeah. Um, and then we've got on the bonded warehouse in, on Lambe is roughly around today, I think around over 80 casks. Right. Um, and that's where we have our most intense single malt maturing. Um, yeah. And we can then extract from those casks at different times different percentages that we need um, when we're bringing it into our blends. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's at the moment, the small batch blend is, it depends as an average, we would say, give or take one to four weeks, four weeks max, three. Because the blend I'll, just is, take, I'll just introduce the bra, uh, the bottlings that you do have. It's, it, it's uh, maybe you can take us through them, uh, Sabine, and just tell us maybe okay. a little bit about them and their flavor profile and how they're produced. Okay, sure. So this is uh, our small batch blend. It was um, our it's our flagship brand uh, with a signature blue coloring on it. It's a blend of grain and malt whiskey, roughly 70-30 in terms of, of split. It's yeah. uh, bourbon cask matured um, and it's triple distilled. And then it's finished for around one month in a cognac cask. The mm -hmm. cognac cask, as I've explained, um, is rich and intense in flavors. Um, and while we would uh, love to be able to say we can trial them for six and ten months in a cognac cask, we did find that it just kind of cannibalized the lovely sweetness and delicacy of a... Uh, overpowered. A, yeah, and overpowered that lovely grain uh, distillate that we want to hold on to. Um, so that, that that small batch blend is, is as I said, very much uh, our flagship brand, and it's one we go to market with before we introduce our other SKUs. Um, it's 40% ABV, non-chill filtered. Um, is I think in terms of its its taste profile, it's everything you you would expect and, and hope to expect from a good Irish whiskey. Uh, very smooth, very easy to drink, floral, cracked pepper, citrusy notes coming through um, with a very delicate finish. It just goes down so easy on the tongue um, and evaporates nicely in the back of the throat. There's a lingering sweetness, not too much of a long finish, but a lingering sweetness as you would expect from a from a young whiskey, um, yeah. and uh, yeah, we we continue to to get uh, great praise for that because it seems to be so adaptable with bartenders and cocktails, for example. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask: is um, is that one designed to be drunk neat, or preference for cocktails, or, or how do you see it being drank? Um, I I would okay. I think in terms of strategy, when we were talking about. What, what's, what whiskey are we going to come out with and what are we going to go to market with that is versatile, that can cross um, many different drinking occasions. So absolutely, you can drink this neat, which I do lovingly. I think it's great. Um, even if you add a drop of water to it, it, it opens it up very delicately, gets a lot of the caramel and honey notes that you'd expect, even a bit of butterscotch. But um, the reason why as well with this specific profile of this whiskey is and as I had said, when we were focusing on the U.S. market, it was really trying to get bartenders to use this in their cocktails, uh, in terms of mixology, showing the diversity of uh, an Irish whiskey and how it can work within those particular types of drinks. Um, having no pot still in it as well, um, uh, kind of lessens the the spicier type of higher notes that you'd expect um, from a, a blended whiskey with pot still in it. But um, in, in the U.S. market, it was really greatly received. Um, also, in terms of the European taste profile, it went down really well. Whereas we noticed then in Asia and Russia, while this is still being accepted, they tend to like a more spicier, complex, higher ABV. So therefore, that's why we introduced then more of our, our other SKUs to that type of customer. 
Right. And this retails for what price, uh, Sabine? Um, in Ireland, I, at the moment, it's around between 43, 45 euro. Yeah. Um, you know, however, that uh, I'm not going to commercialize anyone's off license, but there's a couple of hot offers going on in August. But um, uh, and in Europe, it's roughly, you know, 10 euro less than in, in the States. So it's um, yeah, it's 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 good. It's in a premium price range. Um, we kind of like to position it, you know, plus 10 minus percent on tealings in terms of positioning. So we yeah. feel that it's holding its own on shelf. Okay, and the next one you have then is your single malt. Yeah, so even straight away, the color tones on this uh, depict a, a much more intense kind of um, uh, reference to the cognac cask finish in this. So this one is, of course, 100% uh, Irish malt whiskey, uh, triple distilled. Um, it's uh, slightly older than the blend, around five years old. Um, it's finished for a longer period in the cognac cask, anything from four to six months. Right. Um, therefore absorbing a lot more of the flavor intensity and color profiles you'd expect from the, the French oak. Um, and as well, being a malt, it can certainly absorb a lot more of the intensity of the, of the cask than a blend can. Um, so this single malt is 40% ABV as well. Uh, its taste profile um, is, is very much kind of right, dried fruits, um, ripe banana, tropical. Um, on the taste, it's got notes of kind of um, coconut, um, and the finish is, is very long and lingering. This is the type of whiskey that you would savor sipping um, and, uh, and enjoying, um, particularly as the long finish just seems to go on and on. And I've, I've heard it said, and, and, and I thank those that have complimented us, that it's a, a young whiskey that punches above its weight uh, yeah. in terms of its taste profile. Oh, absolutely. I think in terms of, uh, you know, value for money and in terms of getting flavor intensity it's a yeah. fantastic whiskey at the price points what's this what the single malt is what price has been single malt is between 58 and 60 euro um yeah. in ireland um and yeah it's 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 at a very competitive price point when you look at other cognac has finished whiskies uh in the market yeah. um between the two skews in in over two years we've received over 28 awards from the various establishments and, and award shows so I think it is being recognized as a, a quality liquid. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and and really the single malt is kind of more of what you're going to see in the future because as we lay stock down on Lamb Bay and we let it sit and rest, it is all single malt. Um, yeah. And that's really where we're, we're, we're really looking forward to the innovations for the future, which is, of course, your next picture. Um, yeah. this and it's the one I have the sample of and... I've actually uh, complained to Lodge because I have very little of it left. But um, <laughs> you didn't tell me. <laughs> yes, but yeah, no, I it's uh, my bottle. <laughs> no, this is one I, I I've gone through pretty quickly. But uh, yeah, maybe, maybe you'll give us your, your your official line on this particular one. Okay, um, I guess Sergius, I think it was one of the earlier liquids you tasted when you were on the island. Um, uh, a few years back because this is single malt, single cask strength um, on the island, 100% island matured. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's an incredible product. I mean, as a, again, going back to us being a startup company, we, we launched this as a cask program where we've only uh, identified 20 casks to release within this particular uh, collection. Um, so therefore, you know, much and all as I'd love to see it on, on Irish shelves, it really depends on who's going to buy the first cask. Right. Uh, so you're getting a roughly 350 to 400 bottles from the cask, remembering that French oak casks are, are, are bigger than bourbon barrels. Yeah. So the volume is a little bit more. Um, it's uh, taste profile, it's, it's a higher percentage ABV as you'd expect. So each cask is positioned in a different place in, in the sea cask room on the island. It is imparted with all of the maritime conditions and, and um, I suppose elements that, that one would expect from an island matured whiskey. Um, I suppose what I should note here is that when I say island matured and, and mar maritime climate is that there is an extraordinary high portion of sea salt uh, along the eastern coast of Ireland. It's one of the highest in terms yeah. of, of, uh, of Europe, but also then the combination of these kind of rich phytoplanktons and, and algae in the water surrounding Lambe deliver this very, very pure air. Um, yeah. And then, you know, add a little bit of wind to that and, uh, and sea spray, then you've got yourself some very unique uh, climatic conditions which are absorbed into the wood. 
And I think it would be fair to say that when we taste each different cask from this collection, every single cask has a different taste profile. The ABV varies from, I would say, starting at 49 up to 59%. I think the one you're tasting is the first cask released in Dubai in March this year. So that yeah, 57%. Was, yeah, 57.9. And I think what's rather extraordinary about you know, um, this cast strength is that, you know, of course, we would recommend adding a little drop of water to it. And it just totally diffuses a lot more of the complexity of the aroma within the glass. Um, you can still drink it. Pure yeah, very comfortably. Really burning your throat off. I, and I'm not a big fan of cast strength whiskeys personally to, to consume. I, I prefer something max 45 percent. But I was yeah. pleasantly surprised by this um, and, and the, the, the aroma that's coming from it, rich in malt, as you'd expect, but there's subtle elements of salinity and brine coming through. Um, there and, is uh, there is definitely a sea influence there and it's subtle. It, it doesn't bring through the iodine flavors yeah. that you might expect, yeah. but it, yeah. you definitely get this the seaweed kind of flavor coming through. And, you know, I've just opened the bottle and it's a small bottle, as you say, but... It, it is the room, room is just filled up with the aroma. It's, it's very, you know, it is very floral and very pungent. Yeah, yeah. And again, I, I think to understand that, you know, while it sits in the cask, of course, then what we do is we do, you know, do a first fill, second fill we, within that cask profile just to keep it rich. And then yeah. we, we let that then sit for the final time of maybe a year or two years. Um, yeah. This is just an example of, of the lovely glorifier that we had on display in Dubai. But the cask yeah. now that's gone to Japan, believe it or not, is is 58%. Um, and I found it has got a lot more licorice notes in it. It's got a lot more of the uh, capiscum kind of, you know, fig, uh, very unusual spice notes coming through and, uh, and, and very little salinity because it was chosen particularly for its more of its aromatic profile rather than its uh, maritime yeah. profile. I suppose that's part of the beauty of single casks, of course, as well, yeah, that each one it has its own, you know, characteristics. Uh, but so, you, I mean, you've got two skews in the core. A any any plans to introduce new ones to the range or what are your future plans then, Sabine, if you can yeah, divulge um, anything? Well, uh, funny you say that, uh, Sergius, because we were due to launch a new product um, at the beginning of the summer. Right. And of course, things were kind of put on the back foot. Um, I mean, I myself haven't been to the island in a long, long time. Our production has, has certainly slowed down a little bit because of COVID. But we do have our product and it's bottled. And we're bringing out in um, uh, end of August, September, and we'll be launching it on uh, three drams with irishmalts.com, uh, okay. um, is our blended malt. So what we've done is we've used... Uh, three different distilleries, three different distillates, um, and blend them together. So it's both double and triple distilled. Okay. It's a higher ABV of 43%. Um, and it's it's pretty exciting. I only got to taste it myself last Thursday evening. And um, I found that for me, I, I, I drink it with a little bit of ice if it's a higher ABV. Um, it has a very interesting spice note to it, um, a lot more of kind of cardamom and fig coming through um, and of course it has um, the the island matured single malt in it as well so it's I suppose it's 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 unique it has its signature cognac cask finish because everything that we do is is driving the cognac cask finish forward sure. I mean we, 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 we want to be known as I suppose being the leaders in terms of cognac cask finishing um, and uh, yeah so this is this is something I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what what you guys think and of course our whiskey fans out there as well. So um, we'll also be doing a little uh, tweet tasting as well in in the autumn. So um, watch this space. Fantastic. I mean, th there have been a number of others. I think um, Walsh Whiskey have brought out a cognac finish and Egan's brought out a cognac finish. Yeah. I'm sure there's others as well. Uh, I know there was some element of cognac in one of the revivals from Teeling as well. Mm -hmm. um, Cognac is undergoing a bit of a resurgence as well. We talk about whiskey increasing in sales worldwide. Obviously, pre-COVID, I suppose, all these figures. But cognac has been growing significantly over the last 10 years. Yeah, I think it's definitely becoming a, a trend again. I think within the top 100 spirits categories, we're seeing as well the, the rise of, of cognac brands coming through. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I can only really speak about Camus in terms of their excellence that they have, um, they, they, they did a shift. I mean, it's very clever thinking again from, from them because they, they did a complete rebrand. So they kind okay. of moved away from the traditional, you know, super luxurious, almost perfume like bottles, which, which they still have in their, in their ultra prestige ranges. But they decided to make a, a series of bottlings that are more approachable to the consumer, yeah. especially the younger demographic. The price point was better. The taste profile was was more floral um, and easier to, to to drink. And again, pushing the cocktail, uh, I suppose, trend forward with cognac is where they they really targeted those consumers. Yeah. Um, and as you're talking about, you know, other brands that have, have, have used cognac as finish, I think the difference is we have a French master blender who yeah. with a French cognac distiller. So his whole approach to our blend and production is significantly different to what I would presume an Irish producer would do just yeah. simply based on traditions and, and, and knowledge. Yeah. So from the ground up, you, you're, yeah. your whiskey is designed around the cognac blends and the cognac casks. Um, just for people that are probably aren't that familiar with cognac, you know, it is a wine based product essentially. Um, but I mean, the price for cognac can be into the many thousands of euros per bottle. So there is that um, very high end and usually ends up going to the Asian market, if I'm not. And obviously, cognac was a big thing with the uh, wrappers as well, which has seen <laughs> yeah. a, big, uh, a big increase in it. How have you seen? Um, the demographics change, Sabine, over the over the years. I mean, you in marketing, you would have seen what was happening when you were at the early days when you were in uh, IDL and then moving over now to Lambe. What, what's changed? I think um, across the the category, there is uh, there's an approachability. Mm -hmm. There is a, a significant shift from from it being, I suppose, stigmatized as as the old man's drink, which I know IDL forged the path for um, in terms of their mixability with, with uh, their leading brand. Um, uh, in my experience, traveling around markets as well, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not preaching to, to, to an older demographic. I'm, I'm really, our target range for Lambe is, is from 30 to, you know, and upwards. Um, we wouldn't be trying to compete with the, the younger age demographic simply because of, of volume and, and our positioning. Yeah. But what's, what's really clear to me is, is there's a lot more women drinking whiskey, which I'm very happy to see. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a lot more younger people who are really looking for something different. Their taste profiles have matured. Um, I think because of different innovations with cask finishes and flavors, uh, people are drinking a lot more mixed drinks. They're choosing their taste portfolios very carefully because they've already been introduced to maybe the leading brand. And now they want to leverage up on that taste profile and say, well, look, you know, I like this, but I think there's a, a backstory that people look for as well in order to connect with that product. Um, and, and when I, I see particularly, uh, as you say, cognac primarily kind of niched into the hip hop market. Yeah. You know, it has its pluses and negatives course and then in Asia as this super luxurious almost you know you know not for everybody type of product that has changed significantly as well um mm. and and we're becoming I think more you know stabilized in terms of of, of the market demographic um yeah. and it's going to continue going to deliver yeah just going back to being an independent uh, you touched on the fact that you you have planning permission to actually create a micro distillery on the island when when we see that uh, starting to happen? <sighs> ah, yeah. Look, if I had a, a magic uh, a magic ball to look into, we'd we'd love to. We, I mean, we were starting to hopefully get our foundations laid down uh, this year. All right. Okay. So we've got 2021, 20, 22, 23, We can really start to build that. Um, but I guess, Sergius, you know, it's it's a very complex thing when you're talking about building a distillery when there's no electricity on the island. Um, yeah. you know, there's no energy source. So how do you create your energy? Uh, yeah. what do you do with your waste? Um, how do you cultivate your, 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 your production? Um, so I suppose just to, to give you a slight insight in, into our ambition is, is of course, you know, um, respecting the, the ideology and beliefs of, of Lamb Bay and, and Alex, uh, bearing is, is sustainability. So yeah. if we can, um, build a distillery, that is um, as, as eco-friendly as possible, 
utilizing wind energy um, as well as sea energy would be a, a wonderful thing that we're trying to explore. Something very you know? unique, I think, anyway, that's fair. Yeah. yeah, and it may mean that it's going to take longer to build, but I think we have wonderful natural resources um, on our doorstep that we need to, to cultivate for the future and, and, and ensure that they are a sustainable way forward. Um, the island itself is, has domestic farm animals on it, so in terms of waste, we need to be very careful about what we do with it um, in terms of feed for the animals, you know, using the mash, for example, that we would be producing. Um, all of that is, is being placed into high consideration. Um, and it's it's going to be a small still. We're, we're talking maybe a thousand litres. And, and sure. the ambition is to create, you know, uh, island pot still cognac cask finish whiskey, which would be fantastic. Um, and, and it I is a conservation they, island as well, isn't it? It, it yeah. is. Uh, you can't just go and do whatever you want on the island. No, you can't. And, and and it probably would, we would imagine it's operating only four or five months of the year purely because of the weather. Um, yeah. It's from November to, to February, the island is pretty much out of bounds simply because of currents um, and getting over and back is just too risky. Um, so uh, we have a shepherd and a farmer who live on the island and they might get off maybe once every three or four months. So I, I have to admire those guys. I certainly couldn't do it. Yeah. Tell me, uh, as an independent bottler, what are the challenges that you face that perhaps a distiller wouldn't face? I suppose, um, I think I have to think of the current context when we're trying to release new product um, or we have the ambition to create new product. Um, I, I originally came from a kind of a, um, a chemistry background, so I, I studied applied chemistry um, so I'm, I'm kind of unique in that way that while I'm a, a marketeer, I'm, I'm pretty nerdy about production and, and distillation. And um, I, I think I do freak uh, our, our production masters out when I end up talking to them about the different ethyls and alcohols and concentrations within the distillates because it fascinates me. And I think there's lots of, of ways you can explore um, your new innovations with it. So as an independent bottler, we don't have that luxury to be able to to really explore from the, the starting process, um, what are you going to use in your ingredients? You know, what type of distillate is, is your, your, your quest for? That's yeah. a challenge. Um, sure. You know, and, and with that, we don't have our own independent bottling line either. So, okay. you, you know, you have to outsource quite a lot of what you do. Yeah. And you need to, to have, um, you need to have really good planning and, and uh, project management to, to be able to ensure that everything is ticking along smoothly. Um, and, and you're utilizing all of those relationships when you're working with, with people as an independent bottler to, to make sure you're cultivating a trust and, uh, and, and assuring that you have then product for the future. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's varied and it's different, um, while at the same time, I guess the luxury we have is, is we can just literally take our product and go to market. We're, we're, yes. we're just focused on getting it into the markets first. Um, we don't have maybe all of the uh, additional pressures and, and stresses that go with maintaining your distillery, your workforce. And there's a lot to do with that. And then I have greatest respect for people who, who do that. Um, and again, congratulations to the Schlieve Lag uh, couple of this today with their announcement. I mean, years of work goes into building a distillery. Um, sure. uh, we've kind of fast tracked our, our brand growth by, by just literally being an independent bottler, ensuring that our product is consistent and getting into those markets, um, you know, structuring our distribution network. Yeah. If we look to the Scottish model, where obviously there are probably around 100 distilleries, a little bit more, but there are many more independent bottlers. Mm. What do independent bottlers bring to the Irish whiskey market? As a group, apart from just yourselves, but in general, wh why are they significant? Well, I think, first of all, you know, you're seeing a lot of choice on the market. You're seeing a kind of diversity with cast finishes that were never there before. Um, you're seeing very unique stories developing. Um, the whole reason why these these unique bottlings are coming out um, are driven by, you know, a, an ambition, a story, a, a fundamental, you know, uh, will to succeed in something that they're very passionate about. And I think... What we're seeing a lot of is is uh, when you when we look across to Scotland, I mean, you know, blended malts and 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 uh, the number of distilleries and the growth of independent bottling over there, 
is fantastic. And and in a way, is is that the reason why you know Scottish whiskey has eighty percent of global market share? Um, Irish whiskey is is still around five percent. We've got mm -hmm. so much to do and and so much uh, growth to go for that. I think the more independent bottlings we can get that are ensuring that the product is good, uh, first of all, um, yeah. and and, um, and is is laying down the true foundations of what Irish whiskey is, then I, I just think it's it's got plenty of room to grow. Um, yeah. We don't all have to be on the same back bar. We don't all have to be, you know, in, in, in the number one. It's, that's not really what it's about. I think it's emphasis on craft, on on smaller distilleries, on yeah. on unique. Um, productions which will drive the category forward. Yeah. Uh, just another question. There's a couple of questions came in. Um, COVID being the big one, I suppose. Uh, as a small independent distiller, obviously it must have had a huge impact. I, I mean, we were talking a few months ago about Probion and other shows that were were cancelled. Uh, obviously, these have big effects on yourselves. Can you just tell us some of the challenges that you've faced? Yeah, I mean, I suppose the one thing that I'm 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 pleasantly surprised about since COVID mm. hit is is how resilient the Irish whiskey category is and the people behind it. Um, yeah. For example, Sergius, I would never have thought that I would be doing as many virtual conversations and whiskey shows and podcasts. Yeah. I, never in my wildest thoughts last year would I have thought I'd, I'd be engaging with a, a much wider audience through this particular media than, than ever before. Um, yeah. You know, I think uh, the community of Irish whiskey producers is, is a tight knit community. I would hope it remains so. I think yeah. we need to ensure that we are all got each other's back while it's still competitive, no doubt. Of course, but yeah. at the same time, we, we remain resilient. We've been resilient before, even in the 1800s. We've been resilient after, you know, two world wars and our own civil war. I think you know, um, a pandemic is actually going to stall production processes and maybe the whiskey tourism side has taken a big hit. I, I, I would have yeah. uh, a great sympathy for that. But in terms of production and our plans for the future, I don't think it's going to stop us. We're, we're the, the train is on the track and, and we're just going to go forward. Yeah. And then uh, there's a couple of questions from people asking. I, I know you've never made an issue of this, Sabine, and I really take my hat off to you for this. Being a woman in the industry, obviously there has been a big change. Uh, certainly, more women being involved, more women drinking whiskey, more women involved in in distilling, as we've seen in production, in marketing, in all aspects. Have you ever faced any challenges, and and how do you see your role as a woman? Does it matter at all? No, I mean personally, I don't even consider my gender. I'm just I'm just Sabina. You know, I'm yeah. just doing to do and um and i've never really questioned that um of course i've i've visited markets where there's been some rather unusual situations uh particularly i can recall one of the challenges when i was visiting the southern states in america and i was met with a rather um intense um sales meetings and 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 uh literally just ignored purely because of my sex but i made sure right. that i shouted a little bit louder <laughs> and that and, still exists then does it yeah, you know, I mean, within Ireland, you you know, and with anything to do with building a brand, you need a little bit of tough skin. You know, you're not always yeah. going to have open doors. You're not always going to have people saying yes, and they think you're brilliant and your whiskey is brilliant. You just got to believe in what you do. And um, yeah. I, I see myself as, you know, it, it, one minute I'm lifting cases of whiskey into an off license, and then the next minute I'm presenting in front of 200 people. It's it's just what I do, and yeah. and I do it because I love it, you know. Yeah. Obviously, the travel is curtailed at the moment. Yeah. yeah. I don't mind that. I'm kind of enjoying that. <laughs> you did, I'm sure you did quite a lot of mileage over the last couple of years. Yeah, you know. yeah, absolutely. I'm just saying, um, there's a couple of questions here. One is about South Africa. Okay. Um, is that a future market that you see as a, a market for yourself? Well, South Africa, as we know, has had huge growth, um, yeah. undeniably for, for, for other brands, particularly the, the leaders. Um, excuse me, it would be a market we would love to get into. Africa in itself is, is complex in terms of, of getting into the market. We are presently uh, in, in talks with people in Nigeria. Um, so it's, it's, 
yeah, it, it's a challenge because we're a small team as well. You know, you, you need a lot more feet on the ground to get out there and have those face to face conversations and, and travel to those markets to develop those relationships. But um, I would hope to see South Africa in the future, partially because I was born there and uh, okay. I have an affinity to Cape Town anyway. So um, if there's any chance that I can go back and establish something there, I really would. But there's huge potential there. There's a big whiskey market there. Um, and, and there's I didn't know you were born there, actually, Sabine. I yeah. thought you were from the beyond the pale somewhere. Yeah, no, my, I'm originally, I grew up in Limerick. My family are from Limerick. Shout out right. to Limerick. Um, and, uh, but I married a dub, so I'm based in Dublin and happy for that. So, yeah, a bit of a multinational family line in, in, in my, my family history. Very good. Just finally finishing up, uh, how do you see the future of uh, Irish whiskey and Lambe? Um, I think the future is going to be about stepping up to the challenges that we face. Um, the future is going to be about making sure that we in Lambe continue to create and innovate with what we're doing um, with Cognac Cast Finishing, driving our, our premium and super premium portfolio. Um, we need to make sure that we, 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 we develop and, and grow a stronger foothold for investment for the future you know coming out of the startup phase into something a little bit bigger would be great to see that in five years time um we'd like to be able to double and triple our cases in terms of sales over the next five years um and we'd like to know that 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 when you see lambe and you walk past a bar that it's 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 there it's it's the awareness and the brand building of it that we want to create our future is is not going to be easy as we continue to struggle with the, the challenges, the tariffs that are obviously against us as well. And again, yeah. for smaller producers and brands, um, the tariffs are, are, you know, they're just something you just can't, you just don't want that on your breakfast bowl in the morning. It's another complication, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I was I was uh, I was relieved to hear that, that the distillers are coming together to to look at how we can, you know, forge a little bit of a relief in that. Yeah. Um, but I think we need to be careful in Ireland in terms of all of these distilleries producing so much liquid that it's not just sitting in a warehouse and going nowhere. We need to make yeah. sure that we work together collectively and, and get it out there, get the, the, mm -hmm. get the spirit of, of Irish whiskey out there around the world because there's no point distilling it and leaving it in a warehouse forever. Yeah, very true. Sabine, look, thank you very much. It's been brilliant having you on. I, I really have to commend you for taking the leap that a lot of people wouldn't have taken you know, to go and do a, a new venture and you've certainly put your mark on it and it's always been a pleasure to talk to you and deal with you. So wish you every success in the future. I'm sure you'll be back roaring after all this COVID business as well and yeah, be back out to the good. island. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Pleasure okay. encouraging. All right. Thank you very much for joining us, Sabine. Talk to you Thanks, soon. Rob. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Well, that's been great. Great to hear from an independent bottler and get their viewpoint. Uh, Sabine's done sterling work with uh, Lambe. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be here next week, half past seven. And uh, we'll fill you in who our guests will be later on in the week. Enjoy the rest of your week and uh, take care. Goodbye.